Trey, thanks for uh, joining us. And before we delve into uh, Malik Carr, a.k.a. Poot, what was the audition-like process for you? I mean, how did it come to you in the first place? Well, I um, my audition, I was uh, discovered by a woman by the name of um, Linda Townsend, who's actually from Clinton, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, what happened was I was actually um, an R&B and hip-hop dancer first. You know, that's what I started off doing, traveling back and forth to New York, Showtime at the Apollo, and just getting the chance to, you know, win like five times. And, you know, throughout my gangsting career, she actually discovered me at a show when I was, I want to say around 18, 19 years old. And um, she said, I can tell that you're not afraid of, you're not afraid to, you know, show your talent on stage, but she doesn't specialize in, you know, dancers or musicians. She specialized in acting and actors. So she said, I have this show called The Wire. It's an HBO series that, um, I want to try to submit you for. And, uh, I said, all right, you know, I give it a shot. And she submitted me, man, for the HBO series, The Wire in 2001. And, um, I went in there. The audition process was weird because I had never, like, uh, like did an audition before. So when I went in there to read with Pat Moran casting, um, it was, it was, it was great. You know, I mean, it was something that I was, um, getting used to. And, you know, Pat Moran, she just told me to, to really just, you know, like sort of like breathe and take it easy and go ahead and, you know, nail the audition the best way I could. So it was a learning experience for me. You know, I didn't really know what I was up against, but, once I went in there and read, I actually read for Weebay. A lot of people don't know that. I read for the character Weebay. And um, when I got the call back uh, to read for David Simon and, you know, Nina Noble and um, the, you know, the late Robert Cosbury, rest in peace to him. You know, I went I went in there to read and they called me back a couple of weeks later and said I didn't get uh, Weebay, but I got this character named Malik Pukar. So I was I was excited about that. How did you prepare for uh, like the the slang terms that obviously Baltimoreans use? Because I know that obviously you're from DC, but I believe there's kind of a difference there, really, isn't there? Yeah, um, you know what? It's 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 a difference, but at the same time, everybody has their own way of using slang words. Like I know in DC a lot, we say Joe, we say Youngin, you know, and um. I actually hear people from Baltimore saying the same thing sometimes. You know what I'm saying? But uh what I did was I just I Baltimore is a is a wonderful, you know, wonderful city. It's a wonderful place to be. And I had already been spending a lot of time out Baltimore anyway, because I got family members that live out there. So it wasn't uh it wasn't hard at all to embrace their culture and embrace how they interact with each other and um and it and it helped me out a lot, you know, with with the character who if you like pay attention to Malik Pukar, he's so, sort of like a follower that hangs around like the the people that's you know that's, that's making the major moves in the city. So it wasn't really hard to find those type of people that were in Baltimore City, you know. So I spent a lot of time out there. I did a lot of research before, you know. I actually dove into the character, even though, like I said, The Wire was my first acting uh, job ever, you know, and. I was just, you know, that's how I prepped myself so I could be prepared, you know, when I when I went on set. You were saying there that it was your first uh, acting job as well. So when you got those first scripts through, what was you thinking to yourself? Was was you thinking, you know, I'm going to go this way or was there was there somebody guiding you? You know, actually, a lot of research for my character when I first got the scripts, uh, I asked a lot of people on the set questions like, the one that played D'Angelo, Larry Gilliard, he can tell you if you ever speak to him. I wasn't afraid to ask questions. You know, um, J.D. Williams, who played my best friend, Bodie. Uh, Michael B. Jordan, you know, who played Wally. I wasn't afraid to ask these guys, you know, if I needed guidance. So when I would get the scripts, if, if it was a particular scene that I didn't understand, I would ask them. You know what I'm saying? And um, I want to say they guided me, you know, all the way up until now, I still you know, got a got a true, you know, love for these guys, man, because they, they, they really took me under their wing and helped me out. A lot of those guys were already um like T V stars already. You know, these guys had already done done projects. But um yeah man, I just one thing I can say about every cast member from the wire is that they were they were family oriented. 
So it all they always made me feel like I was home. I mean, jumping into season one and and Poot kind of seems like a sort of the Joker of the pack, you know, laughing and joking and everything like that. Until obviously the moment with Wallace, which kind of changes everything. What did David Simon say to you about this the moment with Wallace? You know, that scene was 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 really a tough tough scene. Um, David Simon's encouragement, you know, on that scene was really to just lock into the emotion of what I was getting ready to do as far as, um, you know, kill my best friend. And the way he described it was more so, you know, like if an animal is suffering real bad, if you watch an animal later and he's suffering, you take him to the vet to put him to sleep because you don't want to see him suffer no more. So if you can recall that scene when Bodie shot uh, Wallace and sort of like me taking the gun and finishing him off, sort of like putting him out of his misery, you know, so reading the whole dialogue in that manner, it was, oh man, it was, it was amazing. You know what I'm saying? And, and David Simon's writing in his, you know, authentic way of putting it, it, it helped me yeah, a lot. I think it's sort of the first time that you see Poot have real, world emotions where at that scene where it's in the stairwell just before it's about to go down there's you and Bode and it kind of feels like this is the first time he's opened up beyond obviously the you know the high rises really I mean is that how you felt as well with that particular scene with Wallace you know it, it kind of like went towards you know even though it was negative it was a way that I, I sort of like stepped up and um it goes into, you know, me running the high rises and stuff like that. So I guess in that type of um, life, that lifestyle, you know, in the streets, if you, you make a move like that, you catch a body, you know what I'm saying? It sort of like brings you up to a position where, <laughs> where people actually know. And um, excuse me, man, I'm, I'm sneezing today. But um, right. what, people, what people actually know and um, it, it brings you into like a, a whole nother light or in a whole nother position of, you know, authority or like you did that, you put in work, you know what I'm saying? So it brings your level up. I mean, it's a really emotional moment and obviously it brings Poot into it as well. But th there's that one side of him and then the other side of him seems to be this uh, kind of like lover you know, he's he's a ladies' man, really. And yeah, yeah. he's kind of the only guy in it who is a ladies' man. So <laughs> when you started reading that, what did you think? You know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm the only guy who's getting some action this time. That was a good thing, you know, because um, with, with, with me, uh, you know, with him writing that, that I was like crazy over women and stuff. I mean, some of that stuff from my past, I could really relate to that, you know, because before I was married, of course. I was out here, you know what I'm saying? But as far as, um, you know, him being crazy over women, man, I just thought that was unique, too. You know, I was the only one. I was the follower, but I was the one dealing with the women. You know what I'm saying? And that was a good, um, that was just, it was just a good way to, to uh, play that character out, you know? I mean, Poot does have a lot of comedy in him. I mean, the, the moment where, obviously, uh, he meets Herc and Carver in the, in the theatre theater. as well. I mean, <laughs> that's just a complete, yeah. what I would say, slapstick comedy moment. And, you know, you guys yeah. get the upper hand out of it. So Poot has all these comedy aspects to him. And was you surprised about how that happened? I was, man. And a lot of it was natural, too. Because, um, you know, just looking at the looking at the scenes and the scripts that everything he wrote and those lines, I was more... I wanted to give my natural Trey Chaney ability to the role, you know, so I could be a comedian sometimes, you know what I'm saying? And um, I just wanted to give that. I wanted to give that off. How did you see him evolve through the seasons, you know, from one all the way through to five? Because obviously he's the guy who gets out. So how did you feel he evolved over those seasons? One thing I can say about that, I appreciated the him evolving because if you can see, it went from a negative to a positive. So it showed a way out. It shows you can start off in the street. You could be in the hood life. But once you get out of that, it's up to you to make the choice. Do you want to continue that? Or do you want to, you know, get a job such as I did with the Foot Locker scene and sort of like school and educate how I educated in school dookie on, you know, you haven't really been through the stuff that I've been through yet before you can get to this point. 
I mean, I've killed people. I, you know, I mean, it was, it, it, it just showed a dynamic way of getting out, getting out the game. And, 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 and I think, you know, I relate a lot of that now to my music that I put out. You know, when I put out videos such as Dedicated Father and, you know, anti-bullying records that receive praise on MTV jams and, you know, Revolt and different BT networks and different things like that. It's kind of showing like how Poop from the Wire is is de- totally different from who Trey Chaney is. You know, I'm a I'm a positive man. Is is you know taking care of my family and, and and wanting to see positive things happen in the world. So I want to be able to put out that type of energy. You know, and that's I, I always related that to how David Simon and all the writers on The Wire kind of like wrote my character. I mean, you're talking about David Simon there and obviously everybody else who was writing. Who was, who was giving you the most feedback? Was it David Simon or Ed Burns or was it, you know, when George Pelicanos was writing? What was they well, saying George, to you? George Pelicanos, um, collectively all of them, you know, because we all would see each other. So more so collectively, all of them would give me that type of, you know, feedback. Or if it was something that I had a question about, I wouldn't hesitate to, you know, go find them and, and ask them what was going on, you know. So collectively, that's why I said I can't stress stress enough, like, the um, importance of when you do work on a set to have, like, that personal relationship with the writers and directors like we did on The Wire. I mean, we, we really engaged in long dialogue conversations before we even shot scenes, you know. So that's why I said collectively, I can't leave none of them out. They all helped me. I mean, you were saying there, obviously, about the writers and everything, and that at one point, I believe it was cancelled after season three, and then it came back again. So what was what was you hearing during these downtimes? Because, you know, it was never a huge ratings hit. I know HBO are not that bothered about ratings as such, yeah. but it was still never connecting with outside of that core audience. So what was you hearing that time, and was you worried that it was never going to break out? Put it this way. I knew we had something special. Uh... With the ratings back then, with social media not being as popular as social media is now, you know, I, I, I truly feel that we we had something special and it and it just wasn't received by the by the by the big wig folks that it was supposed to be received by until I wanna say now, because the show is bigger than it's ever been now. Like when when that when they did that run in December you know, like on HBO Go, you know, now, now social media, I mean, we were getting a whole bunch of like publicity off of just Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, you know, because that's that's big now. So now I feel that the show is being more appreciated than ever. You know, I mean, as far as breaking out when it when, when it came out, it wasn't it, it wasn't that yet, you know, until now. Do you think it didn't break out because of. Uh, the politics and the social aspect of it as well? Uh, in, in a way, you know, some people could agree with that. You know what I'm saying? Because one thing that you find in this, in today's society is people are, are sort of afraid of change. And the wire was, was, was a change in history and the reality of what the wire brought to the table. People wasn't ready for that yet. Like, I mean, if you watch the wire now over and over, David Simon was writing uh, stuff that's happening now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was, I mean, you know, just just the war on drugs in Baltimore. I mean, all of that stuff, it applied to Baltimore, but it started applying to different cities around the world, you know. And like I said, it was before its time. So that's why I feel that it may not have just automatically caught on like it is now, you know, because a lot of people, like even... You know, recently when, I mean, just think David Simon sat down with the president of the United States, like recently. So, I mean, just think back then, he wasn't sitting down with the president. You know what I'm saying? So now it's, it's, it's all about what, what was happening now. You know, back then it wasn't received well due to, you know, conflicts of just people not being ready to, you know, understand it or accept it. When did you, see the change in people you know basically come into the show i mean was it was it around towards the end of the show or was it a couple of years later you mentioned social media there obviously but has it only been the past couple of years or was it when the show was towards the end how did you how was people approaching you about it well i want to say towards the end of the season um towards the end of the whole season like five 
that's when I, I mean, after after all the seasons, I would get approached, you know. But when it really started getting into, you know, the education with the kids in season four, the politics, the media, it sort of like took the fan base to a whole nother level. You know what I'm saying? On saying that these are real issues that really affect today's society. Um, I get approached a lot by people that just can talk to me about a whole full season. And not even everything that I did, but what all the other characters did, you know. So it's um the approach, man, is, is is so 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 in the now, you know what I'm saying? Like they people people live for now and what's going on. So it's just weird, and, I, and I'm just and I'm just like happy that I was able to be a part of a show that people actually consider, you know, historical. I mean, because a lot of actors and actresses they can't say that, you know what I'm saying? But we were fortunate. Uh, do you still see m- many of the cast members now? Because obviously it's such a wide cast, uh, but well, most I just of you out... were sort of in small sections, really. Yeah, I, I still see the cast because we still do events together. So, like, especially Anwan, Anwan Glover, who plays Slim Charles, like he's just he was just featured in my video, a video, a music video called "I Want To" that I just put out, and um, me and JD Bodie, you know, we, we talk all the time. Um, Andre Royo. Uh, Hassan Johnson, Sonia. I mean, majority of the cast, and I mean, I might be forgetting a couple of them because we all still communicate, you know, but especially when we see each other, that's even more, you know, I mean, because everybody's busy. So, you know, once everybody's able to get together, it's like it's like family, man. It's all love. I've got to ask you this because obviously I'm British and you're American Uh and, you know, Idris and Dominic, when they first came to the show, American. Were you surprised that they were British or did they keep up this American accent? I was surprised that they were British. They were cool, though. Like those guys, Idris and Dominique, they always treated me like a little brother. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's just funny to to, to see them now, man. I mean, like I said, with, with them being able to um, sort of like make the the whole American accent their own, you know, that was that was very creative on, on, on the writer's part, you know, to and, and even them as actors. I mean, you know, that's that's kind of hard to do for some people. And and they really pulled it off, you know, and I really respect those guys and look up to them to this day. And um, I'm still waiting, man, for that call to do a film with one of those guys soon. You know what I'm saying? So Dominique and Idris, I am waiting. <laughs> well, when Idris gets the James Bond gig, you know, you could be one of the villains or something. I got to be one of the villains, man. I, I definitely do. I'm going to reach out to his people, too. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask you this. Do you have an orange sofa? Um, I want one. I don't have one, but I do. You know what? My sofa, I want to say, let me let me ask my wife real quick. Hey, I, what color is our sofa in the house? Yeah, no, nah, I got a red one. <laughs> I don't got an orange one. I wish I had an orange one though. Like, I mean, I, that's that's like classic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just stepping away from the wire now because obviously you were talking about your music career, and I, I think yeah. that most people probably don't know that you know you've not gone into that sort of rapping or anything like that. You're actually talking about real life situations, you know, fatherhood, safe sex, and things like that. So, where did that? all come from for you was it was that all way back in the day and you've always been doing that well i've always been doing music but i want to say you know my son was born june 1st 2006 i mean he's getting ready to turn nine years old next week and he was the inspiration um behind i want to say my whole movement on what i actually want to talk about when i'm speaking as far as music is concerned uh a lot of these like like videos that I put out, that's that's really who I am. I mean, I'm, you know, dedicated father, as you can see. You know, I feature my grandfather, my dad, myself and my son. I mean, this this is this is real life me rapping about what's going on in the world today. When I talk about issues like, you know, live world AIDS anthem and, you know, having the privilege to actually shoot it at the AIDS Memorial Quilt headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. I really drove up there because I wanted to embrace that that energy on what I was getting ready to do, because I I, I mean, who doesn't know someone or or I'm, I'm speaking for myself. I mean, I yeah, of course, I know people that have died from HIV AIDS or they may be suffering from it right now. But at the same time, 
why not put a message out like that to the world on practicing safe sex or safe sex or thinking before you act, you know, and, and making a making a wrong decision when it comes to your health. Um, Anti-bullying record. You know, so many of our young people are getting bullied, even adults. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to put out records like Mike Bully, Dedicated Father, Live World AIDS Anthem. The recent record video, because I always shoot a video company with my songs. And a recent video I just put out called I Want To. It's a club, you know, it's a, it's a club banger that, that really focuses on just having a good time. You know, we live in a world today, man, where, you know, a lot of people don't just come together and rejoice no more. A lot of people are sad. You know, a lot of people are hurting with, with everything that's going on. And I wanted to put this record out and show what I, what I like to do for fun. You know, I love to hang out in DC where I'm from. Ben's Chili Bowl, which is, um, you know, the, a, a great, food place like a landmark for Washington DC that everybody eats at. You know, the different clubs and Anwan Glover, who's who's like a brother to me, well who is my brother, was in the video. Now I want to show people that if we keep uniting and having fun and um you know just rejoicing, this world probably could be a better place. So I think that's why my songs they resonate with people because I'm really giving them who I am. You know, I'm not giving them Malik Pukar. Because that's not who I am. You know what I'm saying? I'm not out here selling drugs, sitting on an orange sofa, talking to 30, 40 women, you know, doing crazy stuff like that. So I just wanted to kind of like, I, I figured with music, if you give people who you really are, I, I think it resonates with them more with, with that, whatever it is, you know, and, um, I, I, I just believe in my music right now is sort of like when the wire first started, it may not have you know, generated so much, but I'm making lifetime music. Like Dedicated Father, when it premiered on all those networks last year, you know, Revolt, MTV, BT, I get calls from those people every year, you know, so this music is forever, you know, and that's kind of like the direction I'm trying to set in music. It takes some time being an independent artist, but it's it's worth every minute of it. I'm, I'm in a studio writing every day. I mean, these are positive message records as well. You know, these are not, uh, you know, you're throwing money around and, you know, like yeah. a bling or anything like that. But I mean, anybody who follows you on social media shows how how quickly you're out there and doing stuff and hustling. I mean, you're giving a real positive message to the fact that don't be afraid to get out there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You can't be afraid to get out there because, I mean, who else other than yourself is going to do it better? I mean, yeah, it's managers and I... I have people around, but when I really want to, you know, put something out there, it, it has to, I know it's going to touch someone. You know what I'm saying? As long as it touches that one person who it needs to touch, I, I just, you know, want to continue that. And you've done a couple of films as well. Uh, the Meek Mill, you know, are, are you enjoying yeah. back into films as well? Yeah. yeah, Meek Mill, real good, real good guy. You know what I'm saying? I, You know, just to say, I know where Meek actually came from to now. And, you know, when we did the film Streets, some time ago in BET, they run it. It was a good project to work with him on. Um, my other film, Six Hearts, One Beat, um, which I independently produced with, uh, Frank Jackson from here about how I fall in love with a young lady with, you know, four kids has been accepted in the, um, Southern Maryland Film Festival this year. And we're doing a whole bunch of promoting. I'm always independently putting my stuff out and, um, you know, it's starting to, you know, make its way to the majors and I'm just happy about that. I'm shooting a new uh, TV show right now called Rise, where I play a, a, a guy by the name of Kai Finley who runs a money laundering operation on the East Coast. Um, you know, it's written, directed by a brother by the name of uh, Taylor Young, right, uh, seeing pictures. And we, we're just putting together a lot of, you know, authentic work. And I mean, because that's all I specialize in. I want to, I want to be able to just like, do the work. I always put stuff like that out there on social media about just doing and continuing to do the work and, and putting it out so people can, you know, appreciate it and accept it. Uh, obviously, you're doing your music. You were a dancer previously. Well, I guess you're still dancing with the music and everything. You've got the films, you know, TV as well. What do you, I mean, obviously you enjoy it all, but at what point do you think, I like this a little bit more? Um, It, it happens frequently whether I'm acting, uh, sometimes when I'm acting and when people are able to see the work, that gives me that, you know, extra push to keep doing that and saying I like it more. But when I'm performing and I'm able to write a song, shoot a video and I see it, 
all over national television, it's it's like a catch twenty two. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I think I like this more. But I guess just the art of um entertainment, period. It could you know, under that entertainment umbrella, you know, you're talking movies, T V film, speaking engagements, even when I'm speaking at schools, you know, around my city, I, I start to feel that I like that more. Because I mean, you know, when I like, I like it, it's just weird for me because I mean, there's so many different things that can just fall under the entertainment umbrella. So I would, I would, you know, label it that just entertainment period. I love that. And of course, talking of entertainment, we must mention your book as well, which came out a few years ago. So yeah. you're also an, an author as well. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the truth you can't betray, which is on Amazon.com right now. Just talks about when I first got on the wire. But in between that, you know, coming up in Forsville, you know, D.C. and trying to find my way as a young person, you know, and battling with, you know, being bullied with, um, you know, um, you know, drugs and different things of that nature. But it's more of an inspirational piece. Like how I'm talking to you now, it, it, it serves as that for people to just read and, and take heed to what what I'm saying. And maybe they can learn from it, you know. Going back to the wire for the last question. Okay. What's your abiding memory of that time throughout the whole five seasons? What's your mm -hmm. abiding memories of it? My abiding memories of the wire is just the um the the positive energy that went into making it. And this is, you know, with everybody. Like I said, it's sort of like um me being an actor and me being involved with a show that was that powerful. I probably didn't like take in everything that you all seen, like the, the consumers or the viewers. So now it's sort of like coming out of a, a maze, you know, with with it being over over with now. But like I always say, the wire never dies. You know what I'm saying? It's still it's it's growing every day, actually. But um, my memory is just all the cast members being like family. That that's just the the memory I have because even being on set. They just, they just helped me out a whole lot, you know, and I really appreciate each and every last one of them. 